Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are. My name is Adrian M. Warren and I am the host of the Kinderis Pictures podcast, founder of Kinderis Pictures and host of the Kinderis Pictures YouTube channel. So thank you so much for tuning in to the first installment of Kinderis Pictures Race Movie Commentary. It's a part of a series or it is the series that we are doing for this year's Black History Month. So first up, the movie you are about to watch with audio commentary by myself is Oscar Michaud's Within Our Gates. It was his second feature film and it is believed to be one of two responses to The Birth of a Nation, the historical, famous, infamous um, D.W. Griffith film. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump into it. Here is Within Our Gates with audio commentary by me. Hello everybody, this is Adrian M. Warren. I am the founder of Kinderis Pictures, host of the Kinderis Pictures podcast. Um, and we are watching Within Our Gates, starring Evelyn Preer, written, produced, directed by Oscar Michel. Super long subtitles, those <laughs> titles. So, I believe these titles were actually recreated when this film was found. It was believed to be lost at first. So let's go ahead and read it. Um, at the opening of our drama, we find our characters in the North where the prejudices and the hatreds of the South do not exist. Haha. <laughs> Though this does not prevent the occasional lynching of a Negro. So Within Our Gates was released in 1920, first in Chicago. Um, I have never been able to find, I, I probably need to read an Oscar Micho book, um, like a biography. I'm a little bit lost on exactly how this movie was distributed because a lot of the information that is available, generally available to the public, talks about its release in Chicago. So of course these movies were, movies in general during this time were like sent to different, it's in the, still the case, were distributed to different movie theaters. But how Within Our Gates found its footing became the, the cultural turning point it became um, for black cinema, as far as distribution goes, I am not aware. Okay, so Sylvia has been proposed to. Flo Clements plays the role of her cousin, I believe. I'm a preacher. See, we got some jealousy going on. A little side storyline. So this movie is widely believed to be Oscar Michaud's um, response to the birth of a nation and it was partly that but more so his response to just a lot of things going on in the country after World War One, during World War One, race riots um, and unemployment issues with employment still we've got you know of course racism um, racial violence lynching this was some basically his response to that more so than to specifically to um, D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation. So initially, this movie had a hard time finding an audience or Michelle was having a hard time getting it played pretty much because the Chicago censors were scared. It was that another race riot was going to start up and People were going to be upset with the lynching scene that, that we'll see later in the movie. Which is funny but it, because apparently everybody was okay with the birth of a nation. But this movie, as, as is always the case when it comes to 
<laughs> black artists, artists of color. Um, everybody else can can talk about race in a certain way and civil issues, nationwide issues, social issues, and it's groundbreaking and it's different. But sometimes when other people, usually the victims of said social issues, <laughs> when they decide to tell their side, everybody gets freaked out. So Evelyn Prayer, as I've mentioned in the podcast and probably in the last, um, yeah, in the podcast, the, the, a few episodes, she was one of the Lafayette players a stock company that performed in New York and had different chapters in uh, Chicago, I want to say Philadelphia, and in the South. They had a group that traveled throughout the South, and I think everybody kind of took turns um, touring. They performed dramatic plays. This was something that was different for African-American stage performers. Um, Anita, uh, initially called the Anita Bush player. She is the dancer entertainer who founded this company. So Evelyn Prayer was a very popular player in that stock company along with her husband, Edward Thompson, and then people like um, Dooley Wilson, who we know from Casablanca, and Teresa Harris. A lot of the a lot of other people went on to have significant stage um, notoriety as well as film. All right, so we've got some little treachery going on. Got some <laughs> people on the run, some identity issues going on. I haven't watched this in a while. So apparently this man who I believe is Sylvia's fiance, I believe. Either Sylvia or Almost. Um It's wanted by the police, it appears. And I remember this part. This is yeah, um Sylvia's fiance sending her a letter. And Alma play black folk. Flo Clements is a little jealous about it for whatever reason. <laughs> so Flo Clements, I don't remember. I don't believe she appeared in any other movies. Maybe one or two outside of Within Our Gates. Um, another stage performer probably was a Lafayette player. Wouldn't be surprised. But she really did give a good performance in this movie. So something I did want to bring up about the music that's being played. So I'm not certain if this is the original um, orchestra um, composition or their compositions as the movie played. But the other um, Michelle, Michelle film that was released this year, A Symbol of the Unconquered, was another movie that was believed to be lost and then recently found. But then they put, um, they created music to go to play over the movie and the music that was played was very modern very um jazzy different didn't wasn't necessarily like you know this classical or even ragtime music that you would use be used to hearing in early 20th century movies so whoever um redid the music for this movie um really did a good job like I said, this movie was deemed to be lost for many years and a copy was found in Europe in the 1970s and it was pieced together. The titles, the, um, you know, the wording had to be, some of it had to be repeated, but then other people or in other cases, whoever was responsible for restoring the movie, I believe it was the National Library of, um, of um, what is it, Library of Congress. 
they um, they had to refer to Oscar Michel's books in the way he wrote um, his stories, the way he wrote dialogue to kind of put together uh, what could have possibly been said in the inner titles. So we got some cheating going on. <laughs> This is a this is a thing that was very typical in um, race movies. Not even race movies, but in um, classic Hollywood movies of the time, the 1920s and 1930s, Prohibition era, when you know people were were gambling and, and drinking, were were kind of portrayed in a glamorous way. You know what I mean? Um, often, well, I won't say in a glamorous way, but they were often portrayed as. Um, major things in movies whether they were kind of shown in a glamorous way or shown as you know oh this is sinful this is oh oh god okay <laughs> but it was a major thing in movies in general in the 1920s and 30s you will see a lot of scenes with people sitting at poker tables at card tables drinking playing games and somebody cheating and Somebody getting shot. <laughs> we saw it. See it in this. We saw it in um, Hallelujah, 1929 movie, and we also see it in movies like um, Life, the 1999 movie with Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence. It was just a, a something that we that was that's often associated with the 1920s and 1930s. And um, a, something that we saw in a lot of, and still see in a, a lot of black cinema, or another element, a lot of reference to dreams, the supernatural, um, a lot of emp empathic people, empathic characters. You know, it's people seeing things in dreams, feeling things, sensing things. And Carmen Jones in the play and as well as the movie, there's use of astrology, there's use of tarot, uh, cartomancy, things like that. That is something that that was definitely very common in, and st like I said, still is in black cinema and, and, and black American life in general. Intuition. <laughs> Got a lot of silent film drama, a lot of people throwing themselves, <laughs> touching other face, and oh God, okay. Sir. <laughs> I read things and my God. <laughs> So Sylvia has been placed in a very compromising situation. Oh, got some some domestic violence going. On. Okay, I, I just I told you I haven't seen this in a while. This is my first time watching this in a minute, and quite a bit. I don't recall some of this. I remember this whole setup, but I don't remember people putting hands on folks. So 
So that was her. Okay, in a brief missing sequence, Conrad apparently rushes from the room and leaves the city without awaiting Sylvia's explanation. Sometime later, far from all civilization and in the depths of the forest of the South, where ignorance and the lynch law reign supreme, we find the hamlet of Piney Woods and the school for Negroes. So this is a turning point for, for, um, for Sylvia, the main character. Life is different for her. The plans that she had set in place um, are kind of thwarted. And we get into the actual story you know, what's about to happen with it, what her character, her character's mission. So she meets up with this reverend and they, he runs the school for, for the, for the kids, the black kids in the South, in this particular Southern town. And he's, he's looking to Sylvia to, to, you know, help him out. They both work together to gain finances and alleviate whatever problems they have with the school. So Michelle also addresses um, discrepancies in the education system or what the education system was back in that time. And the inequalities with that and the finances. So again, Oscar Michelle, he's very deliberate with what he wants this film to say, what he wants to address. Whereas, as opposed to, like I said, it's widely believed that this is his response to um, D.W. Griffith's movie, The Birth of a Nation. But Oscar Michel, with this movie in particular, he does this thing where he doesn't center... How can I phrase this? He's simply discuss, discussing or bringing to light issues that African Americans face, especially in the South, just in general. He's not exactly centering white people. He's not centering whiteness at the moment. This isn't. If this were a direct movie or a movie that was directly a response to the birth of a nation, we would have we would have jumped right into. First of all, it probably would have been set during the Civil War. Um, Yeah, that's in a way almost like how um, Toni Morrison writes. He does not center whiteness throughout this movie. But he does address the, what the, the institution of whiteness has created for African Americans and what they are doing about it without necessarily what can... You know, how, how do they get help? Or what white person do these characters have to go to to get help? Even though this does happen eventually. Um, you see a lot of movies where, you know, that focus on a struggling school with black students, students of color. And there's usually a white person that comes in, usually, that comes in and fixes everything. Um, that, or, or it kind of almost seems as if the African-American community 
or the the focus, the African American community that's focused in the film, has given up or they can't they can't do it. They're helpless. So we have these characters who aren't helpless, who see what's going on, and they are utilizing their resources, the resources within their own community, to 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 get the help that they need. It's like almost as if they they've accepted that okay, this is our situation. This is what has happened to us. This is what's happening to our students. How can we fix it before we go running out to people that we know? And and I'm probably kind of putting my own my own opinion, a lot of my own opinion into this particular um this particular monologue of mine. But, you know, that's essentially what's going on. Like, how can we fix this problem? Uh, a little tribute to Theodore Roosevelt, who I believe passed shortly before this movie was released. Was released. Reverend Thurston has begun an active campaign for the education of the black race. He asks that the federal government contribute significantly so that Negro children in all of the United States can receive proper instruction. He has called on a number of senators and congressmen within the goal of dot dot dot. So Dr. Luke is exactly, I guess I'm assuming he's an eye doctor, an optometrist. <laughs> he has an eye chart in the back. Played by, um, no, Dr. Vivian, played by Charles D. Lucas. Oh, so the superhero. <laughs> he met, he conveniently looks out the window to see this all going on and stops it and <laughs> typical silent movie silent era <laughs> stuff that we've got going on The police brutality going on. Which is interesting that, that he he isn't being harmed any further than we he is <laughs> with this being set in the South in 1920, 1919. Miss Geraldine Stratton, a rich southerner passing through Boston, a bitter enemy of women's suffrage because it appalls her to think that Negro women might vote, played by Bernice Ladd. A sentiment that seems to be very common in that time. Even some of the most popular, well, she apparently is an anti-suffrage or is anti-feminist, but we won't go into it. <laughs> Okay, so Sylvia is going around trying to talk to rich folks. <laughs> and so this is this is what we wish to point where now we're we're actually going out. Okay, now we have to go beyond ourselves. We have to go beyond our community to um to get the help that we need. 
And then we have the opposite. We have the antithesis of what um, that Bernice lady, or the actress name was Bernice Ladd. But I'm jumping ahead. And some, something else worth mentioning, as time went on, as a lot of more races, race movies came out, um, as more race movies came out, they became, they went from being predominantly black cast films to um, predominantly to all black cast films, including Michelle movies. And they moved on to a point where um, African-Americans were playing the, um, they were playing the billionaires, they were playing the doctors, and we have doctors and educators in this movie. Um, but the intention of this movie, this is, this is where we get into the response to a birth, the birth of a nation. Because we have this character who's the antithesis of what, um, or the opposite of what Lillian Gish's character was in uh, The Birth of a Nation. Whereas the other lady, um, the Miss Geraldine, the other rich lady, she's, she looks very much like Lillian Gish. And it's probably what you might call a, um, hypothetically, she's probably who that character would have been um, after the Civil War into the early 20th century. Western Union. It's so fun to see Western Union. It's, it, I love seeing institutions that are still around and still popular, seeing old, um, <laughs> old, old things about it, you know, old telegrams for Western Union. It's something that I use often, so it's funny to see like a Western Union telegram. <laughs> So Evelyn Preer, like I said, Lafayette player, after Within Our Gates, she became, she essentially became the first um, black audience's first lady of the screen. I, I believe she had been coined that at a certain point. She was our first, you know, where, whereas you had people like, um, or Nana Mae McKinney, who is, who was basically the first leading lady of, first black leading lady of Hollywood, Evelyn Priya, she was the first leading lady, first black leading lady of cinema, period. She appeared in a few more Michelle films and then um, she starred in some shorts produced by the Christie Studios, the comedy studio. Um, those, are, those are actually available on YouTube. Some take off some, Comedic take takeoffs of um, Shakespeare plays and um, yeah, pretty much Shakespeare plays. And she went on to do a few movies in Hollywood, but she she passed away um, in 1932, I believe. She was in her late 30s. She just had her her child. She basically died of complications of childbirth. I believe she was sick before she had her, her daughter and, you know, just had a lot of stuff going on after she gave birth and she eventually passed away of pneumonia, I believe. Very stylish. Her hat, she has some very nice hats in this movie.
So then we have. So then, with the, what's interesting about this movie is now we see, in addition to we're discussing racism, racism is the or race race relations is centered in the script, but we're seeing the perspectives of African Americans and white Americans, um, European Americans. We're seeing these two different perspectives, and they're they're separated in a way where both of these groups are being allowed to hash out their own thoughts on their own without without talking over each other without the the privileged talking over the underprivileged We have a character, um, Miss Evelyn, not this lady that's talking. <laughs> we have this character who is, I'm, see, I'm trying to talk about this without being, it's very hard to talk about this without saying exactly what I want to say, without remaining neutral, but we are used to seeing in a lot of instances where People with power, particularly white Americans, European Americans, they will go to, they will speak about racism and racial inequality, social issues. They will speak to the, the underprivileged, the oppressed groups, but they don't necessarily go to their own spaces, their own homes within their own church and their own community to talk about the same thing. So we have a character that's, that's kind of doing that that's reaching out to her community to get help for the African-American community and she's being obviously, you know, rejected. Then we have the interjection of Christianity, of, of the Bible. Religion. So these were th three, like a lot of common things that were common in, as again, still are in black cinema, religion, um, intuition um, or the use of intuition they, they sometimes combine sometimes they don't sometimes it's separated um, or broken down whereas you have good um, spirituality and bad spirituality but the spirituality is always often a theme in race movies music is as well but it's not in <laughs> that isn't the case in within our gates because it's a silent movie but we have um, religion education and um, Finance, economics, these are themes that, or elements that serve as themes, major themes in a lot of race movies because these things are being addressed, like they need to be addressed. And this was Michelle's way of saying like, hey, okay, this is what's going on with us. It's not necessarily a plea for like, okay, help us get out of this. It's just like, okay, this is what, what's going on. This is how we're dealing with it. And in the background, underneath the surface, bubbling underneath the surface is, but I also want you to know that you all play a major part in it, you know? <laughs> Michelle and Spencer Williams, and the other black filmmakers and writers of film writers, screenwriters of this time, that's a, that looks like a woman <laughs> with a with a wig on, with a with a with that wig and the beard on. But they they were really good with how can I say they were really good with kind of getting their point across. without being heavy handed with it. Because even within this, he's, he's also addressing the negative issues within the African-American community and not not saying it like, oh, this is what happens in all African-American communities. But, you know, these like while we talk about what's going on outside of us and the things that affect us, um, 
the laws and powers that are placed, the obstacles that are placed to keep us from, from getting, um, getting to where we want to go, where, getting to where we should be, obtaining the things that we should have, basic necessities. This is another thing that is caused. It has caused us to wreak havoc within our own community as well. Communities. But something that was an issue with Michelle, Michelle's movies, he denied it. Yeah, he denied it and some, a lot of people still deny it. There was as much as he was, as much as, yeah, we're not going to get into it, but there was absolutely colorism in Michelle's movies and this is, this is part of it. From the beginning, from Alma, Sylvia's cousin Alma is immediately set up to be or paying up to be the, the, the bad side of the coin, the flip side of the coin, the negative side. And you have a lot of other dark skin or darker brown characters who represent the negative side, the quote unquote bad side of the community. But what's interesting is when you see movies like A Symbol of the Unconquer, where we have characters who pass, um, we have characters who are white passing, and they they take advantage of that. They take advantage of their skin to um, to gain a place in white society. They are painted as negative as well. So it's it's so when it comes to color and complexion and colorism, um. It's definitely a black and white thing. Well, I won't even say that. It's definitely a, it's interesting how Michelle does that and, and apparently didn't realize that he was doing it. Like again, as a lot of people do, because it's like you have most of the, the quote unquote good characters in his movies did have lighter skin. A lot of the quote unquote bad characters had darker skin. But then in the midst of all that, you had the characters who were light enough to pass as white. They were also placed in that quote unquote bad um, category in that bad box. And then on the flip side, you have the characters who are very dark, who, who can't white pass or who can't pass as white, but do what they have to do, quote unquote, do what they have to do to fit in with white society, who play up to their, to, um, who play up to um, white people's beliefs and restrictions on African Americans just to survive. Whereas you could say that the people or the characters who pass as white also do the same thing. So these two women have been talking for a very long time. <laughs> so this woman, Geraldine, this Lillian Gish type of character, this hypothetical older Lillian Gish from the Birth of a Nation character, um, represents a lot of people, a lot of um, people of European descent who, as someone on Twitter said, <laughs> humorously said that think somehow believe that God left them in charge <laughs> and have decided, have some have made not only made themselves authority figures within this world, but somewhat parental figures who feel that that you know, people of color, that African Americans aren't nuanced and, and aren't human enough to be able to think for themselves. Who and, and kind of paint that as being helpful. Oh, I'm just helping. I just know what's good for them. You know, whatever. I just know what's good for them. Where it's just like, like who told you this? Like who who put you in charge of this? And Michelle does a, 
again he does another good job of present he presents a lot of characters and and people who have an influence in how these types of things work why people don't get money why black children's educations weren't in art finances because at some point somebody decided that they knew black people better than black people know themselves and then you have the people who do try to help and you know like this woman who gets steered away or who gets convinced out of doing so who become complacent Michelle brings all of these characters, and, it, and this, that, that's just the tip of the iceberg, into this one movie. And which on the flip side could also be, could also be viewed as a negative thing. In a way that. He didn't have the Hollywood budget. He didn't have the Hollywood resources. So he, so while he needed to kind of put as much into this one movie as possible to make it as impactful as he wanted it to be and as it did become, it, um, it, it at, at certain points it does kind of um, get all over the place or go all over the place. And that was the case for race movies, even into the 1930s and 40s. You had these filmmakers who had something to say, but they could they couldn't make these two hour movies. They could they couldn't waste film. They couldn't waste footage. They couldn't waste time. So it's just like, OK, we have to put as much. I have to say as much as I can in this one movie because I might not be able to make a movie ever again. <laughs> so instead of the $5,000 that Sylvia asked for, this lady is giving them Bopping my head to this music. So apparently the music um, was performed and composed by Philip Carley. And I believe it probably is the original music. So when this, whatever this footage was found or whatever was left of Within Our Gates was found, um, the music was still with it, I believe. Well, I assume. And this is something that we, another thing we saw a lot in Michelle movies, I mean, Michelle movies, a lot of gathering at park benches. Um, the movie, The Girl from Chicago, either The Girl from Chicago or The Girl from in Room something, in, in some room. <laughs> um, a lot of um, couples kind of sitting on park benches that, you know, that, that sweet, sappy Hollywood type of romantic thing let's sit on a bench and talk to each other and look into each other's eyes and all of that he made sure he put some of that into these movies as well 
because if you look at Hollywood movies, um, a lot of the way black love is presented in the, um, the early 20th century anyway. It's very rough, it's very tough and hard and you know, we get hallelujah. Hallelujah is the, the, the relationships, the romantic relationships in those movies. The intimate relationships are very, are very rough. We have um, the lead character who becomes overwhelmed with sexual tension for one character in particular. Um, and it's almost violent. It's always almost scary. And then we have the character that Nana Mae McKinney plays, who is pretty much a seductress. And then we move on to movies like Carmen Jones, where that's kind of the same thing. Cabin in the Sky. Um, the, the, the love is always painful when it's presented with black characters, particularly in Hollywood movies then and now. But you have, oh, okay. Well, not the ER, but the AH at the end of, <laughs> end of that. But um, M Michelle D kind of eventually falls into that as well later in, in his movies because of course you need the drama as well. But another movie that I'm going to provide commentary for um, does present that loving, um, sweet representation of black love that isn't like painful and full of violence and, and, and you know, very, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Fleshy. Led by the flesh, led by temptation, almost um, dark. Carnal. Got a little blackmail going on. So this this is Larry. I, the character Larry is being played by Jack Chenault. I believe he is the brother of Lawrence Chenault, another po popular actor who typically played evil, antagonistic characters in Michelle movies and race movies. He actually looks quite a, a little bit younger than um, than Lawrence, so. I was I've I've been been uncertain if that's his brother or like his son. <laughs> because like I said, he looks very young in comparison to Lawrence Chenault. So I believe that was his brother. Yep, brother of actor Lawrence Chenault. And Lawrence was the actor that I mentioned who played the um, white passing character in A Symbol of the Unconquered. So then on the flip side, we do have some instances where in reference to the conversation about colorism where um, Michelle does have these, these lighter characters who do happen to be evil or be the antagonist, but it's sprinkled in. So that is a real promotional photo of Evelyn Prier, one of the most gorgeous pictures I've ever laid eyes on. Um, I believe it was used to help promote the movie and other movies. So I can imagine that audiences probably saw the picture and oh that's the movie that was being used to promote this and so on and so forth. 
So I do believe that Evelyn Prier was, she was a part of the Lafayette players in Chicago, or she was part of that group in Chicago, because Michelle was, his production studio, or his productions were very Chicago-based. He wasn't necessarily a New York filmmaker, more so a Chicago one. So it gets a little dark in this moment. I can't quite tell what's going on. Looks like there's a little robbery going. Well, this kind of um, gives you an idea of the, the condition that this movie was in when it was found and, and, and even when it was restored. So another thing that's being addressed in this movie is, um, which can be, doesn't necessarily have to be uh, related to African Americans or black people in America, but you know, the lengths that people, that poor people might go to or, or the under, the lower class might go to. Okay, yeah, this, this, is, this is a little, it's getting a little muddy because I'm not trying to say <laughs> that only poor people rob people, but it kind of let's 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 change the um, vocabulary. So Michelle also shows the the lengths that people who have lost a certain amount of power, who don't have access to resources, um, what kind of what kind of lengths they could go to, or would go to, to maintain a sense of stability. And I, I bring that up. I know it's, it's like common sense. It's, it's not anything new, but I bring that up because um, because I'm sorry, I'm trying to <laughs> but I bring that up because Michelle is like I said, he's trying to pack all of these themes into this one movie. And we're kind of showing the God, I hate this phrase so much. I hate it so much, but the whole crabs in a barrel type of thing. Like he's he's doing this intentionally. To show, you know, that there are certain lengths that people will go to to save themselves. And also to show that truth will always kind of kind of reign in the situation, because had um, because that character um, Larry, he would have told Sylvia's story in a not so positive way. So now we're in the flashback scene. So this is a scene, this is the moment, these last few moments where um, these last few moments of the film that were kind of, that had people freaking out, that had the censors freaking out. So here's Lan um, Sylvia with her adoptive parents.
a depiction of a love of a, another loving relationship. So with the character of Larry, what I've noticed is Larry is Alma's stepbrother, so not exactly her her full blooded brother or even half blooded brother. So it kind of shows you or give gives you I don't know if this was um Michelle's intent, but it kind of um gives us an understanding of what may have happened with Alma and Larry. Like, you know, how did these two these two characters become the negative characters outside of their or the antagonistic characters outside of you know the the whole thing with skin color and, and skin tone but how did these characters grow up you know at some point they kind of grew up the same way with the same beliefs but you have Larry who who, who can't bring himself out of out of the, that's that's kind of what I was trying to allude to a little a few minutes ago like he can't bring himself out of a pattern and whereas you have people like Flo who who are able to do that for whatever reason. It's all things, it's, it's patterns. It's something else that Michelle is addressing. Generational curses and patterns. I can't bring myself out of this, this cycle. I don't know why, but I know that the world around me has an effect on it. So I'm going to do as, as, as much as I can to make sure I bring other people into it. And some people are successful at that. So we kind of see Sylvia's care and love for children, starting early on with her brother, her adoptive brother. And this character, um, Ephraim, another another kind of mirror of someone that you know. Is, is trying to survive and can't pull himself out of a pattern. So as opposed to just minding his business, he pulls other other people in. But Michelle does this thing where, whether you choose to empathize or sympathize is up to you. But he does make he he presents. They let's put it this way. So these the antagonistic characters, the the. Um, yeah, the antagonists in this movie aren't pure, uh, purely, particularly the black ones, uh, aren't purely antagonists for, for no reason. He's showing this is what our society has done to these people. So you had not Ephraim, but you had that um, that pastor in the earlier scene that was. Um, that he himself actually said, oh my God, I have betrayed my race. What is wrong with me? It's, it's not, you know, it's basically the quote unquote Uncle Tom character um, or ar archetype that's not one dimensional. He's three dimensional. He's multidimensional. He's like, I'm very aware that I am doing this and I can't stop myself. I don't know how to stop myself, but I know I need to survive, and I know I'm doing this because I need to survive, but you know, it's, it's explained in these movies. And it's explained through the character, the characters themselves, except this one. I don't know what's going on with this one. This, this one is definitely a little one-dimensional. <laughs> right now he is, he, at the moment he is, it's just like, he's just being a, uh, try not to curse. He's just being that guy for, and you still can't say for no reason. He's surviving, but it's very, um, oh, not comedic, cartoonish. 
or his actions are very cartoonish. So we have this situation where we now kind of see the um, the connection between the black community in the South and the, or just the black community in general, as well as the poor white community, where you have this the reason that this white man shot shot this um, landlord was because you know he'd been being cheated by him as well. So it's, it's kind of a representation of that phrase. Um, um, I can't remember who exactly says, but you'll have a white man who'll be a white man with a a, a nickel can be je will be jealous of a black man with a dime. So we kind of have that situation, but you know that character, the white guy who shot the um, land landlord, he he's just like no, he he took my money too, you know he's been cheating me, he's been screwing me over, so he's gonna have to pay for that. But on the flip side. While he does take care of what he has, or does what he has to do for himself, he is perfectly okay with letting someone else take the fall for it, as we'll see later on. A lot of, a lot of things, a lot of things brought up in this movie. Maybe too much, possibly too much, maybe not. Getting heavy into the scene. This is kind of where we start seeing um, similarities to the birth of a nation. This is where we really start seeing it. The whole, as we know, that movie, or as you may know, in the climax of that movie, um, things take place in the woods. We've got people running from a situation. We have this white woman running from a quote unquote black man, a white man in blackface, who is quote unquote trying, you know, I won't say quote unquote, who is trying to assault her. And on what we have in this movie is an innocent black family trying to a real black family with real black people and not white people in black face we have these people they are innocent they have done nothing wrong and they are trying and they are running through the woods trying to get away from this situation oh god see <laughs> i was about to say something so shady like like ma'am this is not the time to be fainting and to be <laughs> to be weary. <laughs>
a week later. So where did they go? <laughs> Sylvia decided to return home for whatever reason. <laughs> Get a bag or something. Oh, it's a little doggy, a little puppy. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> well, I got so excited. Well, I'm, I'm, that's that's something I should have said in my head, not out loud. <laughs> you know, karma is introduced. Is, you know, brought us so many. I'm I'm not gonna keep pointing everything out. I know y'all are probably gonna get tired. Like, okay, we get it. We can see. We watch the movie. We know. We have common sense. We're just, you know. They say divine justice, karma. The real killer is just like, I mean, dead. And then in characters like Ephraim, we also see the change in um, in dialect and the way they speak, the way the um, their dialogue dialogue is written out. So this is where we see new dimensions come into this character and because again we see we see what his motives are we see why he is the way he is he's just like you know I I want to survive I don't want to have to like hide and you know run away so I'm just going to play the game but We're provided with a with a result of what such games can lead to, you know. I'm very curious to read more about these white actors. You know, the, the use of media to, to change up a story. <laughs> to rewrite history. Very much like the birth of a nation. So this I think this this is the point where he starts addressing the birth of a nation. Like like okay, this is what that movie said happened. Let me show you what really happened. Let me show you how media, how film, how papers, how newspapers and magazines can change the story, can change the narrative.
Okay, proclamation hanging of the Negro murderers of Philip Griddlestone. The murderer, Jasper Landry, having been captured and having confessed to the crime of which he is accused, will be brought under guard by the citizens of Lawrence to the place of execution, the community committee. So the Landry family has been captured, has been found. And this is where we get to the this, this scene. A lot of silent era acting. Nobody's actually being hit, but <laughs> we've got, you know, people almost being like, like a theater, theater play, stage play. So in this moment, we have what could be perceived as a justification of this family being murdered because they retaliated against this attack or attack. And I don't think that was the same kid <laughs> from early in the movie. But, um, Very, very much a story that we're familiar, familiar with, you know. Oppressed person retaliating against the attack and then being painted as the aggressor. So this, this sequence is absolutely Michelle's response to the birth of a nation. Again, let's tell the story how it really happened. Let's, let's show you, let me show you how media can re, rewrite the narrative And, and provide justification for why this particular group of people doesn't deserve um, equal rights and access to a high quality of life, access to the pursuit of happiness and um, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, you know, all that, that jazz. <laughs> And this, this, another scene. So remember in The Birth of a Nation, we have the black character chasing the white woman in the woods with the intent to assault her, to sexually assault her. And this is where Misha was just like, okay, now let's talk about the things that really took place or something that actually happened. It still happens with enslaved black women with black women in the south black women who work as servants in the south let's show let's show what they have to go through you know let's let's flip that storyline on its head So this is Alma, this whole story or this whole flashback is um, Alma recalling exactly what happened or Sylvia's quote unquote past, the past that Larry was anxious to reveal or whatever. And this is her 
I guess her way of redeeming herself, of, of breaking her own pattern and breaking her own cycle. And so it is revealed that this man who was about to ta attack Sylvia was her father. And he didn't realize that who she was until he saw Scar. So this was Michelle's way of saying, okay, not only were y'all the ones who were assaulting people, but it led to the creation of, of it, it led to, there's evidence, you know, <laughs> that, that this is what was going down. A lot of it. No mention of Cuba. That's probably, um, yeah. This is Michelle connecting with other, other races, with other communities. Uh, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about what took place in, um, among, in Cuba. Let's talk about what took place in Mexico and France, you know. We have the, we can change things. And then what Michelle does is, while exposing all of these scars and all these wounds, and you know this dirt and grime that is you know america he wraps it up in this this tiny bowl just like but we can still be patriotic <laughs> we can still love this country and that and i guess that's kind of in his way as well again not assuming that i, I was in michelle's head or trying to get into his head you know that's also what a lot of filmmakers do to kind of soften the blow you know, we, I had to present you with this heavy hitting message. I had to tell you this. I had to expose all this, but I still want you on my side. I still want to convince you to stay on my side. So let me still kind of tell you a little bit of something that you want to hear. So we have reached the end of Within Our Gates in Oscar Michelle production. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening. Um, so this again is a part of a four part series of audio commentary. Um, provided for um, Black History Month on the YouTube channel. So please follow Kendaris Pictures on Instagram, like the page on Facebook, follow on Twitter at Kendaris1117, subscribe to this channel, tune into the Kendaris Pictures podcast, which is available on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, pretty much everywhere you listen to podcasts. So again, thank you so much for tuning in and I will catch you guys another time. Within Our Gates is in the public domain, like a lot of race movies, so you can probably find it on DVD or Blu-ray for a very affordable price, and you can find it for free on YouTube, the Internet Archive, probably Daily Motion, a lot of video platforms. So again, thank you guys so much for tuning in to the first installment of this series. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was informative. So next up, you are going to see the 1938 film, The Duke is Tops, again with audio commentary by myself, and I will see you then.